the disruption that we're seeing now is that we as individuals and business leaders and communities and societies, we thought we had a lot of time to adjust to these future of work trends and they're simply happening very fast. And they're challenging us to question many of our sort of mindsets and assumptions. Hello, my name is Robert Schmidt. I'm Deloitte's Chief IoT Technologist, also known as Mr. IoT. Welcome to another Coffee with Mr. IoT. And today, my guest is Jeff Schwartz. Jeff leads our future of work practice. And also, you just wrote a book, Jeff. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, what's the title of the book? Well, I'm delighted to be here, Robert. And the title of the book, I think well-timed, is Work Disrupted opportunity, resilience, and growth in the accelerating future of work. So, and it comes out uh, in January. Okay, do you have a book actually next to you that you can show us or not quite yet? I, I don't have it next to me, but what I, 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 this is what the cover looks like. Oh, very which, cool. Uh, which is on Amazon, you know, as soon as you send a manuscript to the publisher, they put it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got it, got it, got it. So it's been there for a while, um, uh, I think since uh, July. So Jeff, I, I work disrupted, how timely, right? Did you start writing this at the beginning of the epidemic or did you write this before? I, I'm just sort of like, did you jinx us or is this sort of like, uh, was this all timely? How did this all happen time-wise? I hope I didn't jinx us, Robert. I actually- <laughs> No, I know you didn't. I, I'm just sort of like, you know. I actually started in a way writing this book in 2013. Um, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, I'm, I'm really privileged to be the, the leader in our US consulting practice of our future of work team, both doing research and coordinating with our various practices and, and our client uh, base. And in 2013, I wrote probably the first article, one of the first research pieces we did on the future of work, um, it was on the open talent economy, looking at the whole continuum of talent. And in 2013, we started talking about ride sharing companies and crowd platforms. And, you know, I, I got a little tap on the shoulder from some of our colleagues who said, I think this is a little bit ahead of its time. And fast forward to where we are today. I mean, we seem to be sharing everything um, on platforms and doing everything in a tech enabled way. So probably about three or four years ago, we recognized that the, the topic that we were actually working on was the future of work and its latest incarnation. And I started writing this book actually about two, two and a half years ago, looking at what the accelerating trends were. And uh, fortunate for us, fortunate for me and the firm, we had set our deadline to get it to the publisher Wiley by June 30th. And by, by mid-March, it was clear that we, we needed to think about how the future of work discussion was changing. And we started looking at really the combination of disruption and acceleration and how they played together. And that's how we got to work disrupted. And we are certainly in a time where work in our lives have been disrupted and they're being reframed in many ways. So you started this before the epidemic. Um, how much of what you thought of a year ago, not a year ago, actually, by now we have to say more than a year ago, well, just about a year ago, changed from what you thought was disruption to what do you think disruption is today? So that, that this, is a, this is a great question. Um, where are we on the... What, what this I might... is the next book. Well, no, there isn't. A, yeah, the, the, the next book will be... <laughs> the next book, I think, is Life... <laughs> Life accelerated, but um, um, work and life accelerated um, sort of questions for, for what's next. We are on a disruption. We are on a disruption and acceleration continuum. And one of my observations, which is a little bit dangerous, Robert, is yes, the future is unknown, but we actually know a fair amount about it. Um, and so the trends that we've been following, the trends around how people and technology are working together, the trends around, I mentioned this article we wrote in 2013 on the open talent economy, on and off balance sheet talent, 
trends around um, virtual work and hybrid work that have certainly been accelerated. Um, these trends have very much been in a sort of a very significant acceleration and forward motion. I, I think what's, what's disruptive about it is the speed at which it is happening. So we've all heard the expression, we're doing things in weeks that we thought we were gonna do in years. That's not just going faster, that's actually a major shift, right? And I think the disruption that we're seeing now is that we as individuals and business leaders and communities and societies, we thought we had a lot of time to adjust to these future of work trends and they're simply happening very fast. And they're challenging us to question many of our sort of mindsets and assumptions about what work is, how organizations are structured, what a career looks like, what we need to do as managers. And so just going faster is not enough. We need to be doing things differently. And that's really the, the central thesis of the book. And if I, I'll, I'll sort of introduce it with this image. From one perspective, it feels like we are navigating 21st century roads with 20th century maps. And it's not clear to me that the way to get ahead right now is to use old maps and old routines. And that's really what we highlight in the structure of the book and the discussion of the book. So I, I'm gonna pick something really simple and um, I just wanted to sort of kick it off with my main question, but one of the things I the most appreciate about the epidemic has been how we all turned on our video. I've been on so many calls where people are on their on the conference calls, right? And you can hear it click in the background, people are doing email and you never really know who was there. And one of the things that's changed is we, I, I love seeing people. I'm so glad to see you, right? It's sort of, it's not quite as good, but it's almost as good as being there with you in person. And I've seen this really change. People have really adopted doing video. And I think that's one of the good things that came out of it. What are the disruptions that you talk about in the book that actually surprised you the most? Well, I think that it's, it's a great question. What disruptions have surprised me the most? Um, what I've been surprised about overall is the adaptability of people and organizations. A little less so governments, but governments are, are, are getting there. <laughs> um, the, the, the question that you asked, the observation you made really about how quickly we turned on um, the video. Um, you know, we've all seen similar statistics, you know, um, in early 2020, you know, maybe three, four, five percent of the workforce that could work remotely was working remotely. And at some point in the spring and the summer, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, the spring and the summer, that number went up to like 50 percent. Um, and it had some pluses and minuses. I think it had some major pluses, by the way. Um, we were able to work with global teams, teams across the country, um, as one of our clients said um, in discussions we had with them in the spring, nobody was in headquarters. So everybody was in headquarters because headquarters was the, the Zoom room or the, or the team room or the, or the Slack channel or the, or the WebEx um, session. And th that actually did some very interesting things for us in terms of well-being and flexibility and, and diversity as well. But what, what really surprised me, again, is how, is how well as individuals, um, and I would sort of rank them, I think the adaptability of individuals and individual workers was unbelievable. I think the adaptability of organizations and, and managers probably followed the adaptability and the agility of our workforces and our our formal institutions, I, I think, are, are typically sort of um, the furthest behind. Um, and I think that that's something to really take with us going forward, as you talked about turning on the video, which is what we learned in this grand experiment, forced experiment, you know, three quarters of the world's working population working remotely and under physical distancing requirements, 1.6 billion people learning remotely. Um, we learned a lot about how we can adapt and how we can make new ways of working actually work for us. And bringing that adaptability forward, 
but also bringing, we're recording this on Zoom. I'm in my apartment in New York. You can tell me in a moment where you are, if you like. Um, you know, our work and our family lives and our personal lives are, are totally integrated. I was recording a, I was on a live session this morning with a, at a vendor conference to run out of Israel, interviewing a, a client in Paris. And uh, my puppy was making noise in the background. So I got a note from the conference organizer about, um, you know, just, just so you know that there's noise in the background. The way that we're integrating our lives and our work is off the chart right now. And I think it's really something to think very hard about how we want to bring that forward um, in the next chapter. I love this, you know, how adaptable we are. Um, the question that popped in my head right away was, why did it take a pandemic, uh, pandemic to do that? But I want to answer your question. And I want to answer your question, honestly, because it's actually quite a vulnerable topic. A little bit over two years ago, three years ago now, I decided I don't want to travel back all the time from to a place I don't want to travel back to. So I decided, what can I do? And so I ended up um, uh, buying a small house in Maui. And, you know, that ended up being such a really interesting choice in the pandemic because I sit in Hawaii now. And, you know, nobody knows except I'm wearing these uh, slightly Hawaiian shirts. But, yeah, we, we talk like we're in the same place and we sit on to two different ends of the United States. And so that's that. Um, it's interesting, too, I think what you said about this integrating uh, life and work. I just had this yesterday, we were on a call with someone and someone's kids came in. And, you know, some people are really sensitive to this, but what I've noticed is that it actually gets me closer to them. It gets me to see the person they really are, rather than what shirt they put on and they walk into work with. And it actually has gotten me closer to some people. So I, I've been really experiencing this coming together and I really appreciate it. I want to ask you the opposite question. I asked you what has surprised you the most. And I want to ask this about us as Deloitte. What's been one of the things that you actually feel we've disrupted the least ourselves or would wish it, we disrupt ourselves more in? What's like, if you'd go back and say one of the things I'd like to change the most, what would that be? Well, I think the question, what, what I'd like us to, what I'd like to see us disrupt a bit more is actually connected to your question uh, a moment ago, which is why did it take us so long um, to get to the point that we're at now? How, why did it take so long to learn about how adaptable we are? Why did it take so long to take advantage of the collaborative technologies that we've had? Um, yeah, and, no the, kidding, and, the, right? and the talent place, um, and the, the talent marketplace platforms we have like my gigs. Um, much of the technology, in fact, all of it. I mean, Zoom wasn't created this year. Zoom was actually founded in, uh, in I think, uh, 2012. Um, the same year, I think, that, um, uh, that Cisco bought WebEx, um, which is sort of interesting. Um, um, so these aren't new technologies. But what, what's, what's been interesting to reflect on, both in Deloitte and when we think about it more broadly, is what has surprised me is how powerful our legacy mental models are about what work is, how we work, how we collaborate, who is the workforce, and where we actually work, right? We have, I mentioned a moment ago, Robert, that sort of one of the themes of work disrupted is that we're using 20th century models for 21st century work. Um, we think that who you are in Deloitte and who you are in a customer organization is what we recruited you to do, right? You are who we recruited you to do. You are the role that we asked you to take on. And in addition to that, you are the different roles that we have directed you through during your career at the firm, right? What we've seen in the last year, and I think what's been unleashed in the, in the last year is the dynamism both on the workforce side and on the organization side, right? And I think in Deloitte, we have tremendous opportunity because we, we are an amazing place with amazing people. And one of my favorite quotes is a quote from Bill Joy, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems. And it's a couple of laws called uh, Joy, um, uh, uh, Joy's Laws. And one of his laws, fairly famous, is that there are more smart people outside your organization than inside your organization. 
And the challenge is how do you take advantage of that? I think within Deloitte, I think we have two huge opportunities. One of course is to leverage workforces outside the firm and, and teams like, like Pixel and some of our platforms that help us work outside are great at that. But, but the corollary to, to Joy's Law is that you have tremendous talent inside the organization if we can just find ways of accessing it and freeing it up and combining it in new ways, right? And we are very powerful in our silos. We could even be more powerful if we actually, I don't wanna say break down our silos because I don't think that captures it, but get to a level of marketplace and sharing so that if somebody goes from the SAP practice to the human capital practice or from the strategy practice to the cyber practice, it's a normal course of business, not for a transfer, but for a project, right? And I think something that we're leaning into, but we can lean into maybe faster and harder is being more agile, even more, I would say even more agile in the organization. And we're seeing a number of clients, you know, Unilever, Schneider Electric, these are very public stories who are focusing on, I would call it radical internal mobility in their organizations. I think there's some upside there for us at Deloitte. I love that. I mean, I love this idea. You know, I, I've learned this over time. I, I'm back, it's my second time back at Deloitte, right? I, I'm a boomerang. I left and uh, came back 10 years later. So you're um, a double boomerang, the, a double boomerang. Well, I only left once. Oh, you only uh, left once, okay. <laughs> yeah, I only left once, yeah. Uh, but the thing that's fascinating to me is, is that when people ask me, does Deloitte do that? I will never ever say no, because I can guarantee you there's someone in Deloitte who does what someone asks me if we do that. But you're right. It's so hard to find out who that is and where they are and what they do, because there's still a little bit of this, you know, my hard drive uh, is my best uh, value. If it's on my hard drive, then nobody else can get to it. And it's not really very prominent, but it's a little bit there to know what's out there. And that's just, I love what you talked about this. And I have to say, it's interesting to me, one comment you made, I don't think anybody hired me to do this show. And it's definitely one of my favorite things I do on a <laughs> weekly basis. But uh, I do think actually there's something in Deloitte about not telling you what your job is in detail, that actually is fascinating to me, sometimes difficult and sometimes fascinating how we sort of uh, don't have such a thing as a job description per se, because I worked in corporate, right? And the job descriptions are way tighter than they are Deloitte in some way, but interesting. I wanna ask you something that, um, and um, I hope that's politically correct to say, but you know, you work in, but you talk about disruption, you talk about change. Um, my personal experience is I, I, I thrive on new things, but also I notice how change is getting harder with age. And so I wanna ask you, how do you keep up with disrupting ourselves, disrupting yourself? And what does it mean to you in your now combined personal work life to disrupt yourself? And how do you keep doing this as we age? Yeah, that's that, it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure it's really about age, but I will, I will, since it's your question, I will, tie enough, it back, I, it. I, will, I will tie it back to, <laughs> to age. There's, um, you know, one of the chapters of the book, we, uh, we really delve into 21st century careers. And, and we talk about a couple of aspects of a 21st century career. One comes from the writings of Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott at London Business School, who wrote a wonderful book called The Hundred Year Life. Um, so we, we're all, many of us, touch wood, our beneficiaries, our, our kids certainly will be of a longevity dividend, right? So if you've got kids who are 5, 10, 15, 20, you know, they, they should be thinking about 100-year lives, right? I mean, their grandparents are in their 80s, God willing. And if you, if you live to be 100, you probably got to work for 50 or 60 years. And when the half-life of a skill, as John Seeley Brown, JSB, tells us, is three to five years and dropping... And the average person is in a, a traditional job for three or four years, has maybe 14 jobs in their life. Um, that's a lot of change that's built into the 21st century career. And it, it's certainly not a once and done model. It's not, you, you go to school, you get training, you go to work for a company or an organization, you work for them for 30 years, you go up through a ladder and then you retire, right? It is a portfolio, right? 
um, it is a little bit of a roller coaster. We actually have an image of a roller coaster and a jungle gym in this chapter on, on, uh, on careers. And it's not just continuous learning, it's a portfolio of reinvention. And they're, they're different, right? Continuous learning has, I think, Robert, uh, an incremental nature to it, almost a directional nature to it. But the idea that during the course of your career, you're going to be reinventing yourself either several or many times, it almost goes back to the beginning and says, how do we develop ourselves as young people and people growing through middle age as we're getting older so that we are prepared to thrive in a world where reinvention is what we get to do? Right. Um, I think you actually compare it. You say it's not a ladder, it's a lattice or something like this I read. Well, it's a, it's, I mean, we, uh, the original, the original picture that we've all thought about for careers is a ladder. You go in on step one, we recruit you as an analyst, you become a consultant, a senior consultant, a manager, a senior manager, a, a partner, managing director. Um, and, you know, this is, is just, you know, a few years between each step and you follow the, the trajectory. Um, one of our partners who retired a couple of years ago, Kathy Benko, who's on the board of Nike now, actually wrote a book on mass career customization and another called The Corporate Lattice. Think of the of the lattice that you have that vines grow on in your in your garden where they're crisscrossing in every different direction. And think of how the vines go in different directions. What Kathy started talking about was that careers really are, are lattices, they're zigzag. And, and we talked to one client who said, well, it's not a ladder. The, the model that they use for careers is it's a jungle gym, right? <laughs> so you can not only go in different directions, you can go in and out and up and down and at different speeds and on, on different contraptions that are in a jungle gym. If you, And we actually have a picture of that in the book as well um, from an illustration from the, the cartoonist that we worked with. So to come back for just a moment to your the, the kernel of your question, the way that I keep myself curious and the way that I keep myself, I hope relevant, um, is that I've always had a mindset that was built around curiosity, right? My first degree is in history. Then I have graduate degrees in both business and economics. Um, I started doing economic policy and economic consulting and then strategy consulting. One of the things I say in the introduction of the book is that I didn't study the future of work in school. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and nobody studies the future of work in school. And, and one of our great data scientists, Jim Gushka, is a fellow this year at Stanford. Jim is a PhD in philosophy. And then he joined the firm to become a life actuary. And then, you know, 15 years ago, he taught him, started teaching himself Python and R and became one of the firm's first data scientists, right? And you talk about one of the great things about Deloitte and one of the great things that we're seeing in the environment now, we get to live like that. And people who take advantage of that and cultivate, John Hagel used to run the Center for the Edge, talked about the passion of the explorer. Um, explorers can be any age and explorers are people of different ages. Interesting. I love that uh, sort of like the curiosity is the part that keeps you reinventing yourself instead of continuous learning. It's an interesting shift to reinventing. I love that. I want to close with a question uh, and it's a personal question and I don't know, my, some people might be interested. I've talked to other people about this, but writing a book is a big undertaking. And, you know, we have the pandemic, so people sort of like have new projects and here and they have thought of writing a book. Um, what's your experience been of writing a book? Is it still something you recommend others do? Um, what's been in it for you in writing the book personally, sort of like, you know, um, that journey? Uh, this is a great question. Um... You know, when I finished writing the book, I, I sent it to a number of people to review it and, and provide some commentary on it. Um, uh, one of them is a, a professor at University of Michigan, David Ulrich, who's probably one of the one of the most famous HR uh, leaders in the world. And his first comment was, you know, just huge congratulations. It's a lot of work to write a book. This guy has written probably a dozen, 15 books. Um, so it is a bit of a mountain climb. Um, to actually uh, do it. 
but but I'll offer a couple of observations, hopefully quickly. One was, um, it was a way of both capturing what I was learning with our clients and our colleagues, and challenging myself to understand it better and to make it more useful. So for me, and the way I organize this book, and if you open it up, you'll see there's three sections and 10 chapters is sort of an introduction. I started literally with the question of like, why are we talking about the future of work? Um, my 25 year old daughter sort of was joking with me. Um, Dad, why are you writing a book on the future of work? Work's always had a past, it's got a present, it's got a future. Like, what's the point, right? <laughs> okay. That's what you, our kids get to do, right? So, and it's a good question. Why are we talking about it? We're talking about it because we're in the middle of disruption and acceleration and we need new maps and new mental models. And then I, I lay out three questions. The first question is, what are the opportunities that are in front of us as we're thinking about this future of work? How is work itself changing as people and technology are combined on super teams? How are employment models exploding? By which I mean on balance sheet, off balance sheet, full-time workers, part-time workers, gig workers, freelance workers, outsourced workers, crowd workers. And then what's happening to the workplace? The, the chapter is basically titled, or the question is, how do you work from almost anywhere? And then we said, if this is what the opportunities are, the next big question is, well, what does this mean for our careers? What does this mean for our organizations? And what does this mean for what does this mean for our leaders and our managers? And how do we build resilience into careers? We talked about reinvent portfolios of reinvention. How do we shift organizations from hierarchies to networks and teams and platforms? And how do we move as managers from a control mindset and a supervision mindset to a design and a coaching mindset? And then the third question, which goes back to work that we've been looking at for a couple of years at Deloitte is, what does this mean for us as individuals? What does this mean for us as business and organization leaders? And what does this mean for us as citizens and communities? And we, we have a version of growth playbooks, different mindsets for us as individuals, leaders, and as citizens. So I found the process, hopefully you're hearing this in my discussion of structuring the thinking, terrific. But the last thing that I'll say is, um, the one thing that I've learned most in writing, in writing a book, I worked with a, with a writing partner, a very talented researcher, uh, Suzanne Reese, who's a Columbia, um, sorry, Suzanne Reese. Suzanne is a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School. She's written a couple of books, spent seven years editing Working Weather Magazine, an award-winning journalist. And what she really helped me think about, hopefully you'll see this in the book, is it's not enough to have something to say. A book is not a PowerPoint in long form. It's about a story. And every chapter starts with a story and continues with a series of stories that help us as readers visualize and experience what we're talking about. So I think I learned something about structuring my ideas. I learned something about telling stories. And I got to interview 25 amazing people from around the world who were very open and generous with their time. So it was, it was a lot of work. My partner will tell you, my partner Kate will tell you that I did not have one weekend or practically one night off from March until June, but COVID was a good time to be hunkered down. So it, the timing worked out well for me. Why? Well, I... I can feel even through video your passion for your book, and I think that speaks for itself. Um, uh, the mountain of work sounds enormous, yet it's great to hear that you still talk. Do you already talking about the next book? So it means you must have been excited about it enough to think about another book, which I'm looking forward to reading the first one. So I am, I am. Once you, once you, once you, you know, once you've figured out how to do it, um, I think it's like a lot of things. It's like when people go to India. Some people go to India once and they say they're never going to go back again. I went to India. Well, I, I lived in India for five and a half years. So you know how I <laughs> dealt with that. So, <laughs> so once you get a taste of something, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting. And I think it's particularly exciting. And I'll end with this observation, Robert. I, I talked at the beginning about how we're living in an age of disruption and acceleration. I think that that's the challenge for us as professionals at Deloitte and as we're working with our clients and our clients challenge is how do we develop ourselves 
how do we develop as managers? How do we think about our, our responsibilities to our communities when it's not just about going faster, it's about actually doing things differently. Uh, one of the comments I have in the book, one of the things I talked about in an, in an earlier conversation is that people who are working between 2000 and 2040 may witness the most transformation in work workforces and workplaces than anyone has experienced in thousands of years. We're living right in the middle of these shifts. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting time. I, I have to say, <laughs> I appreciated the conversation. Much of why I love doing this is the curiosity. I get to talk to people like you and I get to like feed off your energy around this. And I gotta say, you left me with a question that I don't think we're gonna answer here, but I'm gonna have to ponder on, you started talking about pixel and crowdsourcing and what popped into my head was, you know, what's the difference between crowdsourcing and consulting? Uh, beside the fact that they both start with C, there's a lot of similarity between the two. And uh, I've been sitting here the last nine, 12 months wondering, you know, where's that pandemic going to go? And when you talked about pixel, it's a pixel. It sort of popped in my head. I, I got to sort of start thinking about this. But well, let me let me let me let me add a phrase on that. So look, a lot of people have talked about disruption and something to think about when you think about disruption is are you going to be the disruptor <laughs> or We're are you disrupted. going to be the disrupted? <laughs> it's not like it's not gonna happen. So I think that's that's a generalizable version of the question of what do these shifts and changes mean for us in consulting? What do they mean for our clients? What do they mean for our careers? What do they mean for the communities that we're in? Um, uh, and we all have to decide which side of the disruption line we're gonna be on. Are we going to disrupt or are we going to be disrupted? With that, I'm going to say thank you for being on the show. It was great having you. And we have another coffee chat coming to an end. If you missed any of today's show, uh, check out our playlist or any past shows. Uh, and you can also find us on your favorite podcast. And with that, I'm going to say thanks. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Psh.